Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Virtual Time Series Seminars. Today we have uh, Mikkel Blackwork Muller from Princeton University. Uh, it's a great pleasure also to welcome uh, our guest panelists for this week, Rafaela Giacomini uh, from UCL. I also should mention that Christian Wolf uh, is with us, the co-author, to support the paper, uh, at least for the first four, five minutes. Uh, well, I, I, I don't like long introductions, but let me say I, I, I distinctively remember back when Mikkel was in the job market, uh, James Stock going around and saying that Mikkel was one of his best uh, PhD students, if not the best. So I think that's enough of an introduction about uh, the, the speaker today, right? Uh, this is everything. So uh, it's a great topic, VARs. I can't wait to hear you, uh, about, about it. Uh, the floor is yours, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the organizers. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to present this work uh, here. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Dake Lee, who is uh, uh, my student who just graduated, uh, and then Christian Wolf, who was also my past student, who is now at MIT. Um, and as Dimitri said, the project is called Local Projections versus VRs lessons from thousands of DGPs. Um, if you want to access the slides yourself to click around in them, I put them on my website. You can also just Google my name, hopefully it'll come up. And uh, please do feel free to jump in with, with questions, both clarification and if, if you have any other questions during the talk, but we can also have a dis discussion afterwards. Okay, so let me explain what we're trying to do in this paper. Um, so we're interested in the estimation of impulse response functions, in particular thinking about the finite sample issues that come up when you try to estimate such objects. So as we all know, an impulse response function measures the expected response in some macro variable Y uh, following some shock epsilon J that happens at a point in time. And we're interested in the dynamic path of this response. So not just on impact, which would correspond to the horizon H equal to zero, but also in the periods following that initial shock. Um, so um, impulse response functions are very important objects for, for macro for evaluating policy, for matching our structural models to their uh, sort of features. Um, how do we typically estimate them in practice? Well, there are two main methods uh, that people use. The first method is the structural vector auto regression method of uh, you know, Chris Sims. So the idea there, is to take a vector W of observed macro time series and fit this to some recursive time series model. Uh, if you found a way of identifying and estimating the parameters in this model, then you can iterate on this recursive model to estimate the impulse response functions implied by it. So from sort of a pragmatic point of view, what is a structural VR? It is a machine for extrapolating impulse responses at longer horizons from what you estimate uh, in the first few autocovariances of the data, right? So in particular, a VR with P lags will be estimated purely off of the first P autocovariances in the data. And then the parametric structure of the model extrapolates the longer run responses from that short run information. So like any extrapolation procedure, we might expect this procedure to have relatively low variance, but potentially a high bias if we misspecify the model, for example, if we get the lag length wrong. The other uh, method that a lot of people use uh, now, especially in the applied literature, is the local projections approach of Oscar Jorda. Here, the idea is to directly project the future outcome that we care about, H periods into the future, on the current shock. So here, I'm assuming that we directly observe the shock, but there are variants of this that would work for other identification schemes as well. And then you get the you know, impulse response coefficient basically directly off of this projection, and then you do this separately at every horizon of interest. So because this relies on direct projections, there's no extrapolation. You're directly using the autocovariances in the data out to the horizon that you actually care about. So there's no extrapolation, which means that we might expect this method to have low bias, but potentially high variance because the long run responses are estimated off of sort of relatively little information in a finite data set. And so this seems like intuitively there should be a bias variance trade-off between these two procedures oops, and that's what we're going to try to explore in this paper. So what is known already about this trade-off between local projections and VRs? Well, first of all, it seems that the choice between local projections and VRs does matter for many important applied macro questions relating to monetary and fiscal policy, as Valerie Ramey has stressed in her 
handbook chapter. So what do we know? Well, uh, Christian and I have a previous paper um, where we uh, show that local projections in VRs share the exact same population impulse response function estimates, at least at horizons H up to and including the lag length that you put in your VR model and the number of lags you control for in your local projection. So what this means is that um, there is no meaningful trade-off between local, local pro pro projections and VRs if you only care about short horizons. These methods are gonna give you approximately the, the same thing. Or if you choose a very large lag length, then again, the two methods are gonna agree mostly. Um, although of course, in, in practice applied, people typically don't choose very long lag lengths because that would lead to high variance estimates. So it seems like in practice, there is still an interesting trade-off to think about at intermediate horizons and long horizons if we don't use super long lag lengths. Now, in practice, it seems like a lot of applied people recently have been very interested in using local projection methods, which might suggest that they're quite concerned about the misspecification bias that you might have with VRs. But as far as we know, there's been no formal work to try to sort of justify this concern. And so that's what we're gonna to try to work on in this paper. Now, obviously in this uh, seminar, we, you know, we might hope that we could just do some theory, right? Like we all time series econometricians, why don't we just sit down and do some theory to work out the nature of this bias variance trade-off? And there's a very nice paper by Frank Schwarzheide, which looks at sort of the related question in the forecast literature of direct versus iterated multi-step forecasts. He looks at sort of the context of a locally misspecified VR model and characterizes this bias variance trade-off. Unfortunately, the results he, he gets is that sort of this trade-off can depend on all features of the GDP. You know, how persistent is it? You know, which horizons do you care about? Uh, what's the exact nature, like the dimensionality of the system and so on. So, you know, in, in practice, and, and obviously how misspecified are you? So it seems like in, in practice, this analytical guidance is not gonna get us very far in terms of giving us firm conclusions about which methods we should choose and when. So instead of going the analytical route, in this paper, we're gonna sort of take a more brute force approach and do a large scale simulation study of these different impulse re response estimators. And to make sure that our conclusions have some sort of empirical relevance, we will um, base our DGPs on a dynamic factor model that has been estimated on quarterly US data following the sort of very influential uh, handbook chapter by Stock and Watson. From this large dimensional factor model that's been fitted to hundreds of time series, we will then draw thousands of lower dimensional DGPs. For each of these DGPs, we will simulate data and we will apply many different impulse response function estimation methods. So these will include the basic local projection and VR methods, but also variants of these methods that use shrinkage to try to navigate this bias variance trade-off. We will also consider several, uh, several identification schemes. So ones where you observe the shock directly, recursive identification or identification through proxies or instrumental variables. And relative to some other papers in the, in the literature, we will pay particular attention to the researcher's loss function and the role of the horizon in guiding the results. And the basic question we will then ask is on average across these many thousands of DGPs, which estimators perform well? And just to preview the results, uh, here's what we find. We find that it is possible to justify uh, using sort of least squares local projections over basic VRs, but only if you care a lot about bias relative to variance. Second, these least squares procedures that we you know, write about in textbooks are often uh, not quite dominated, but are, are often outperformed by these shrinkage procedures, um, which uh, introduce some bias to lower the variance of the estimators. And so unless your concern for bias is overwhelming, uh, it might be useful to, to, to look at these shrinkage procedures that have recently been proposed in the, in the literature. Okay, so that's the basic outline of, uh, of of where I'm going. Um, so uh, let me just briefly mention how we fit into the broader literature. So as I mentioned, the question of local projections versus VRs is mathematically very similar to the question in the forecast literature of whether we should do direct or iterated multi-step forecasts. And so here there is a famous study that you all know by Marcellino, Stock and Watson, which we're very much inspired by, but because we're interested in sort of structural impulse responses, 
a lot of the choices we have to make for our DGPs and so on are, are going to be different from, from there. Um, so, so at the end of the day, um, you know, like a lot of the conclusions we, we, we draw are not necessarily going to be the same that they draw in their study. There have, of course, been several simulation studies that have looked at local projections and DRs, but these have typically been much smaller scale. So whereas we look at thousands of DGPs that are empirically calibrated, the existing literature has mostly looked at, at sort of a handful of DGPs that have been more sort of stylized. As I mentioned, we're going to depart from the analytical co comparisons and in, in, instead do sort of a brute force simulation study. We're going to look at lots of estimates that have been proposed in recent years that use shrinkage. And finally, I just want to be completely clear that in this paper here, we will only look at point estimation. We're not concerned with confidence interval uh, construction, hypothesis testing, or anything like that. There has been recent work on inference but we're not gonna to speak to that at all. And we're not claiming that our results concerning point estimation apply to these other kinds of statistical problems. Okay, so here's what I'll be doing for my talk. So first I'll very briefly, just to set the stage, go through a simple analytical illustration, which will just sort of, you know, get us talking about the bias variance trade-offs. But then once we've sort of talked about those basic trade-offs, I will then get into the simulation study. So I'll talk about how we generate our thousands of DGPs from a, from a dynamic factor model. Then I'll talk about the estimators that we consider, and then I'll get to talking about our actual results. Okay, so let me jump right into the analytical illustration. So this is gonna be very simple and stylized. It's not intended to try to match the data in any way. Um, we're gonna be thinking about a locally misspecified VR1 model. So the econometrician observes two time periods, a shock, let's say a monetary shock, and some macro variable Y, let's say GDP growth. So they're captured in this vector W. And the assumption is that GDP growth evolves as an AR1 driven by the monetary shock, as well as another shock, let's call that a supply shock. But it's not quite an AR1 model. There is a contamination from this moving average term in the supply shock. And the degree of contamination is governed by this parameter alpha. And we scale by the square root of the sample size, because as it turns out, that will lead to a non-trivial bias variance trade-off asymptotically. The shocks, as usual, are IID, uh, let's say Gaussian, uncorrelated with each other. The parameter of interest to us is the impulse response of GDP growth with respect to a monetary shock, which in this simple model is just the parameter rho to the power of h, h being the horizon. We're gonna consider two different estimators of this parameter. Later, we'll look at other ones as well. The local projection estimator directly projects the future GDP growth on the current shock. And we control for one lag of GDP growth and uh, the shock. And we do this separately for each horizon of interest. The VR estimator is going to uh, fit a VR with one lag in the data and then do a recursive Cholesky identification, um, ordering the actual observed shock first and then normalizing the impulse response correctly to make it comparable to the impulse response of interest. Um, so this would be the exact right thing to do if there was no moving average term in the model. But because there is a moving average term, this VR procedure will be slightly misspecified. So that's going to lead to a bias. So building on Frank Schorpeiter's work, we can then prove that both the local projection and the VR estimator are asymptotically normal when the sample size goes to infinity. Um, the local projection estimate is going to have zero asymptotic bias and some asymptotic variance, the formula which we give in the paper. The VR estimate will have a potentially non-zero asymptotic bias and some aesthetic variants. And again, you can look in the paper for the formulas. But rather than give the analytical expressions, let me just show you some pictures. So here I'm plotting the asymptotic bias and the aesthetic standard deviation of the two estimators. And I'm doing this for two different DGPs. The uh, lines without the dots correspond to DGP with uh, less persistence and less misspecification. The lines with dots correspond to a DGP that has higher persistence and higher misspecification. 
So let's first look at the bias uh, figure. So the first thing we notice is what I already mentioned, which is that local projections have zero asymptotic bias at all horizons regardless of the DGP. And this is a general result. It's simply a consequence of the fact that local projections do not extrapolate. They directly project the future outcome on the current observed shock. So they're giving us exactly what we define to be the impulse response by definition. So there's no bias. In contrast, the VR procedure, right, up to horizon one, it's, it's identical to the local projection procedure, which follows from my previous work with Christian. But then after the previous, after the first horizon, the VR takes the autocorrelation at you know, horizon one and just extrapolates that to future, to, to, the, to the longer horizons. And because of that extrapolation, there's gonna be a bias. And as you can see, you know, the nature of this bias depends obviously on the persistence and on the degree of misspecification, so the magnitude of the moving average term in the model. If we look at the asymptotic standard deviation though, the, the sort of the, the tables are turned, right? So here, the standard deviation of the local projection procedure is always higher than the corresponding uh, VR procedure. Right, so up to horizon one, they're identical again, but after that, the local projection has a higher standard deviation. Why? Well, because the local projection does not force impulse responses to go to zero with the horizon, right? And in this stationary environment, we know that impulse responses do go to zero, and VRs force the impulse responses to go to zero. And so that's a good thing when the horizon is long, right? Um, so there is going to be this bias variance trade off as I already mentioned in the introduction. We can think a little bit more uh, deeply about this trade-off uh, if we start introducing a loss function. So what I do in this slide is uh, I look at a loss function that puts a weight of omega on the squared bias of the estimator and a weight of one minus omega on the variance of the estimator. And what we ask in these figures is, how big of a weight on bias do I have to have in my loss function in order to prefer local projections over VRs, right? As, as we know from the, the previous slide, if I prefer sufficiently much about bias, like, like if I care sufficiently much about bias, I will choose local projections. But the question is how much do I have to care about bias? And so that's what we're answering in these figures. So for different degrees of persistence, and different degrees of misspecification, we're plotting sort of the, 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 the cutoff weight at which you would start preferring local projections. So for example, um, you know, if we look at this number here that I'm circling, it says that at horizon eight, and for this persistence, you have to put a weight of 80% on squared bias, at least, to prefer local projections over VRs. Now, rather than focusing on the specific numbers that we get from these figures, what I want you to take away is that the nature of this trade-off, right, changes dramatically depending on the persistence and on the degree of misspecification and on the horizon, right? Indeed, this sort of cutoff weight, it doesn't even have to be a monotone as a function of the horizon. So even in this extremely simple model, you know, this bias variance trade-off between local projections and VRs is very non-trivial, right? It can depend on many features of the problem, persistence, misspecification, how much you care about bias, and which impulse response horizon that, that you care about. So going forward, we're gonna sort of, you know, give up on the analytics and instead do this large-scale simulation study where we're gonna look at thousands of empirically calibrated DGPs and you can sort of think about that as sort of informing us about the empirically relevant persistence measures and, and empirically relevant uh, degrees of misspecification. We will also enrich the menu of estimation pr 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 procedures in order to sort of further trace out the bias variance possibility frontier. And finally, we will consider other identification schemes that don't require that you directly observe the shock. Can I ask a question at this point? Please. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, just out of curiosity, right? I'm, I'm not sure if you've explored this, but do you have any idea uh, what's happening in different cases? Like, you know, some people turn to over difference of data or they tend to work with log levels. Mm -hmm. Any idea how this affects the bias variance trade off, like different choices on? on yeah, good, good, good question. So, um, 
So in this paper, we are looking exclusively at stationary DGPs. And that's sort of, I think, definitely a caveat that you should have in mind as we go forward. Um, so we are not really looking at cases where the true GGP has unit roots and where you're using the data in level. Um, so in that sense, we will al always be looking at sort of different data. Um, obviously, o over differencing can lead to loss of efficiency for the usual reasons. Um, what we will look at in our, in our simulation going, going forward is what if you're using different data, but you actually care about the accumulated impulse responses. So you, you, you care about the level impulse responses. So that we do consider in our paper, but we are not explicitly considering the case where you have potentially non-stationary data that you directly uh, you know, use in levels in your estimation procedures. Um, I do think that could change the nature of the bias variance trade-off, right? Because, um, you know, going off of some of my other work, um, um, depending on how many lags you control for and so on, that can actually change the convergence rate of some of these estimators, both for VRs and local pro projections. So this could, in principle, lead to an even more challenging uh, bias variance trade-off where, like, you know, things depend on exactly how many lags you control for. Uh, but that's not something that we have anything really to say about in this uh, paper, unfortunately. Okay, um, so now let me talk about the actual simulations that, that we do. So first I'll talk about how we generate our thousands of DGPs. And we will do that based on an encompassing large scale dynamic factor model, which we're gonna appreciate, like uh, abbreviate as, as DFM. So this is gonna follow the uh, influential handbook chapter by Stock and Watson. So the vector XT is gonna contain 207 observed macro time series, which span various categories of macro variables. I'm sure you're all familiar with the data set, right? So these include sort of real activity measures, price measures, international time series, you know, financial time series and so on. And following Stock and Watson, we will model these many time series as following a factor model where there's a latent vector of factors F. Those factors themselves follow a VR process. And then there's also gonna be some idiosyncratic uh, disturbances which, which are independent across a series. And these idiosyncratic disturbances will follow AR processes. So Stock and Watson argue that this kind of model provides a very good approximation to the second moments of US quarterly and macro time series data. We're gonna follow exactly their empirical specifications when, when fitting this model. In fact, we actually directly use their empirical estimates of the parameters in this model where possible. Um, so the factors are gonna be following a VR2 process. And we think about the aggregate shocks epsilon in this factor model as being the, the shocks that we are going to consider as being the shocks of interest for the purposes of defining impulse response functions later. Uh, all the shocks are gonna be Gaussian um, and the idiosyncratic uh, noise terms here will, will evolve as an AR2 process independent across uh, uh, the series. Okay, so once we have those, once we have this empirically estimated dynamic factor model for 207 time series, what we will then do is draw thousands of subsets of five variables from these 207 you know, possible variables. Right? In, in, in particular, we will draw 6,000 subsets. So for each such subset of five variables, we will derive its DGP from the encompassing dynamic factor model. Right? So of course, uh, except in knife edge cases, which won't be the case in practice, all these DGPs will not be finite order VR processes, they will be VR infinity processes. So in principle, any finite order VR procedure will have some bias, but of course, the uh, sort of uh, magnitude of this bias will vary a lot from DGP to DGP, as I will show you in a second. Okay, so we don't draw these subsets of five variables completely randomly. Following empirical practice, we will make sure that uh, each of these five subsets always contains at least one real activity series and at least one price series. And then we're gonna consider two different types of DGPs, 
one which always uh, includes the federal funds rate. So we think of these as sort of standard monetary shock type applications. And another type of GDP, which always includes uh, the federal government spending series, which we think of as sort of a fiscal shock type GDP. Okay, once we've you know, drawn five variables, we will then draw uh, a response variable Y at random from four of the series, namely the ones that are not equal to this, this sort of policy instrument. Okay, so how do we then define the impulse responses that we care about uh, from these DDPs? So in the paper, we look at different identification schemes, including recursive identification and IV or proxy identification. But for today, I will exclusively focus on uh, identification schemes where we assume that we directly observe the shock. So um, the assumption is that the echometrician observes a six time series in addition to the five. And this six time series is the shock of interest, which is epsilon one. And then we simply define the impulse response S demand to be the response of our randomly chosen response variable with respect to that observed shock series at horizons from zero quarters up to 20 quarters. Okay, so there is one parameter in the dynamic factor model that uh, we could not get directly from Stock and Watson which is this matrix H of the impact impulse responses of the factors with respect to the shocks, because this matrix H is not identified directly from just the second moment of the data. So the way that we choose it is that we pick the matrix H to maximize the impact response of the policy variable, so either the federal funds rate or the government spending series, with respect to the observed shock epsilon one. So this is the sense in which sort of that shock epsilon one, we, we think of it as either a monetary shock or as a fiscal shock. It, 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 it's something that sort of strongly affects either the Fed funds rate or government spending on impact. Okay, so I, I just briefly want to um, convince uh, all of you Nico, that these, uh, sorry, yes? Very quick. So what do you, what do you randomly extract a one variable yt out of the w set? I thought you get a bunch of variables and I care about the impulse response of all those variables. I missed this. Yeah, so we, I mean, we we could of course have just, you know, looked at at all the four or five impulse responses with respect to epsilon one. Uh, that we could definitely have, have done that. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't have any particularly good reason why we did exactly this way. Um, I guess- well, That's fine, it's just curiosity. I mean, yeah. it, it, there's yeah. nothing kind of sub that I'm that I'm missing. Okay, thanks. Right. No. No. Yeah. Anyway, no, it's no, right. yeah. I mean, this it's is probably averaging system. across. So. Yes, that's absolutely right. I, I mean, I guess, yeah, we're we're just choosing a setup where, like, for each GDP, there is one impulse response function of interest. But I completely agree with you that we could have just looked at at all the five impulse responses for for the variables that we drew. I agree. Yeah, that that's a, that's a fair point. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to convince you that um, these DGPs that we've drawn in this way are quite heterogeneous, which matches which, which matches sort of the heterogeneity that applied macro researchers face in reality, right? So um, in this table, I've shown you different uh, summary statistics for the DGPs and the impulse responses. So um, the first row here is a measure of the persistence of the DGP. So this is the trace of the long run variance of the observed time series relative to the trace of the sort of usual unconditional variance of the time series. So this is a measure of the persistence of the, of the data. In the different columns, I show you uh, the percentiles of this measure across the 6,000 DGPs. This is the minimum value, this is the maximum value, and then the 10th, 25th percentile, 75th and 90th, and then the median in the middle. And you can see that, that this measure varies sort of widely across the DGPs. Um, although I still want to emphasize that none of the DGPs we're looking at are sort of very near unit root DGPs. So uh, this measure for a um, AR1 process would be one plus rho divided by one minus rho. So, you know, this measure should go to infinity if, if we had sort of local to unity type stuff. And as you can see, you know, we're not 
at in, in infinity, although certainly um, we do have a good bit of variation, right? So again, as a caveat to what I'll be telling you, right, we are looking at data, namely the Stock and Watson data set, which has been safely transformed to stationarity before analysis. Also, if we look at the largest eigenvalue of the VR companion matrix, this one doesn't vary quite as much across DGPs uh, because often it's the federal funds rate or the government spending series that's sort of the, the more persistent time series. And again, the, that eigenvalue is never sort of very close to one. This uh, line shows the uh, degree of misspecification of a, a low order VR time series, uh, sorry, low order VR estimator. So this shows the fraction of the norm of the VR coefficients in the VR infinity representation at, horizon, at, at lags uh, that are five and greater relative to the norm over all lags, right? So if, if the GGP was exactly a VR with four lags, this measure would be equal to zero. If it was a DGP where there was no coefficient, like zero coefficients for lags one to four, and then non-zero coefficients after lag four, the measure would be one. And as you can see, this measure varies you know, widely between zero and one. So this suggests that they, you know, the potential for misspecification of low order VR estimators is, is large, but it varies a lot across DGPs. If you look at impulse responses, they're also very heterogeneous, but instead of going over the exact numbers, let me show you some pictures. So here are six randomly drawn impulse response functions out of the 6,000. And you can see that these are quite heterogeneous in terms of how quickly they die out uh, to zero, but also in terms of how jagged they are, right? So some of them look quite smooth, others are quite jagged on impact. Um, and this is, you know, this is the, the kind of heterogeneity that I think we would expect in practice uh, as macroeconomists, when we think about the, the, the heterogeneity of questions that macroeconomists care about in practice. And this is all on one variable. So it could be, could be GDP. So no, no, these are, these are for different GDPs, which have different. Uh, or any, whatever they are. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm almost uh, ready to talk about the results, but let me just briefly mention the estimators that we apply to data simulator for these many DGPs. So we're gonna consider six different estimation procedures. We have two local projection methods. One is sort of the, the textbook least squares local projection estimator that we've already talked about based on OLS regressions. Then we also consider a variant of this called penalized local projection following a nice recent paper by Barney Sharma and Brownlees. So uh, the basic idea behind this estimator is that we expect in practice that impulse response functions are probably relatively smooth across horizons. But as many of you know, if you do basic local projections, you often get very jagged looking impulse responses, presumably mostly due to random noise. So the Barney Sharma and Brownlees estimator basically takes this unrestricted jagged impulse response function estimate and shrinks it towards a smoother quadratic polynomial in the horizon uh, using sort of, uh, you know, a ridge type idea where you select the degree of smoothing by cross-validation. Okay, then we're also gonna consider four different VR methods. Uh, the first one is sort of the textbook, you know, least squares VR procedure that we all know and love. Then there's sort of the bias corrected version of that where you, uh, you know, do sort of an analytical bias correction that gets rid of the bias due to persistence in the data. Then we look at a Bayesian VR estimator that shrinks uh, using a Minnesota prior, except all our GDPs are stationary. So we don't shrink towards uh, unit roots, we shrink towards uh, white noise. Finally, we're gonna consider a model averaging procedure from this uh, paper by Bruce Hansen. So this uh, constructs a data dependent weighted average of impulse response function estimates from 40 different models, namely a univariate AR1 up to AR20 models, as well as, 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 well as multivariate VR1 up to VR20 models. Um, so you can kind of think about this procedure as implicitly also including a case where you average between VRs and local projections. 
uh, as in the uh, nice paper by Miranda Agrippino and Rico. I mean, not exactly like their paper, but in the same spirit. Why? Well, because as I mentioned earlier, a VR with 20 lags gives you approximately the same results as a local projection with, you know, with basically any number of lags because we directly observe the shock. So, um, um, uh, sort of not exactly, but at least uh, loosely speaking, we are also including uh, the case where you uh, average between VRs and local projections. Michael, a quick question. Please. So for the first three VAR methods, you're conditioning on a particular lag length. So you're fixing the lag That's length. Right. That's right, yes. Or, exactly, but then yes. you're doing Bayesian. So you're not really assessing, you know, the, the idea that you may include more lags, but then shrink them towards zero. Exactly, yeah. That's a good point. So um, uh, as I will mention in, the, in a sec, our baseline results will uh, fix the lag length at four for reasons I will get to in a bit. We've also considered other choices. Uh, in the paper, we um, we also show you what, what happens if you fix the lag length at a longer number of lags. But what we have not tried to do, to your point, we have not tried to, let's say, allow the BVAR procedure to have a long a longer number of lags than the least squares procedure, and then let sort of the shrinkage in the BVAR procedure take care of the degrees of freedom problem, right? So that is... A very good point that I, you know, would be a very interesting thing to explore. I, I com completely agree with that. So, but yeah, that's not in the paper at present. Thank you. Okay, so let me now get to the re results. Um, so briefly in terms of the setup of the simulation, following what we just talked about, for what I'm gonna show you here in the slides, we're always going to fix the lag length for the VR estimates and in terms of the number of lags you control for in the local projections at four, except of course for the VR model averaging estimator, which uses many different lag lengths. Why do we do this? Well, the first comment is that if you try to select a number of lags with an information criterion, in particular, if, we, if you use the AIC, in these DGPs, it almost always selects fewer than four lags. So you can think about what we're doing here, sort of a like a conservative procedure where you use the maximum of either four or what AIC picks. The reason we're doing this is I think in practice, many empirical researchers in quarterly data will usually use at least four lags. Now in the paper, we also show you results when you have eight lags uh, or the AIC results if you wanna see them. Uh, and the qualitative conclusions are very similar. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that later. Uh, we will average across results from all the 6,000 GDPs, but in the paper, we can also split them up by the monetary and the fiscal DGP separately. As I mentioned, we'll be using this loss function that I have early, that I introduced earlier to summarize some results. So again, what this loss function does is it puts the weight of omega on squared bias and the weight of one minus omega on the variance. And to make the units comparable, what we do is that we always divide the bias and standard deviation by the uh, root mean squared value of the true impulse response function. We use a sample size of 200 in for, for our baseline results, although we consider other choices in the paper, and we do 5,000 uh, repetitions per GGP. This is a non-trivial sort of computational task. It takes about a week to run with parallel computing on a research cluster because, you know, like at the end, we, we have 30 million data sets, right? Like 6,000 GGPs, 5,000 repetitions. And some of these procedures, like the shrinkage procedures, uh, are not completely computationally trivial. Okay, so now let me get to the results and I will summarize these results in what we call a different lessons. So the first lesson is that as theory suggests, there is indeed a clear bias variance trade-off between the least squares local projection and VR procedures. So in this slide, I focus exclusively on least squares VR and least squares local projection, which are the purple and the orange lines re respectively. I also show you the bias corrected VR procedure, but only just to show you that that gives you very similar results to the least squares procedure. So basically from now on, I'm not gonna talk about that. that that's sort of very comparable to the, to, the, to the basic least squares procedure. On the left, I show you the bias. On the right, I show you the standard deviation. Specifically at each horizon along the horizontal axis, what I show you here is the bias 
where we take the median across the 6,000 GDPs, right? We compute the bias for each of the GDPs and then we take the median across the GDPs. And similarly for the standard deviation, it's the median standard deviation across GDPs. Okay, so what do we learn from these plots? Well, the first thing that we see is that as we had expected, local projections have uniformly low bias across all horizons, whereas the VR procedure has non-negligible bias, especially at intermediate horizons. Obviously, the bias does tend to zero with the horizon for the reasons we discussed earlier in these stationary GDPs, mechanically, VR impulse responses do tend to zero with the horizon as the true impulse function does. And so therefore kind of mechanically the bias goes to zero. Um, with like in terms of standard deviation though, we see that that sort of the ranking between the procedures is flipped and uh, the local projection standard deviation is uniformly sort of large does not go to zero with the horizon, whereas it does for the uh, VR procedure. So we have this bias variance trade-off. However, uh, as we can see, if we look at the scale of the uh, y-axis here, um, the, the nature of this trade-off is a bit sort of steep uh, in terms of uh, how much uh, you know, standard deviation uh, you have to sort of suffer from decreasing bias. And so to uh, make this trade-off a bit more explicit, um, I will show you this figure. So here we have the horizon along the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, I show you the weight omega on bias squared in the loss function. For each of these cells in this sort of heat map here, how gray the cell is shows you how many DGPs you prefer the local projection procedure over the VR procedure for this particular loss function and for this particular horizon, if we're looking at this cell. Right? So Black cells are ones where you almost always prefer the local projection procedure over VR. And white cells are the one where you almost always prefer the VR procedure over local projection. And as you can see, most of this figure is, is white, right? So uh, you can justify doing local projections, but only if you care a lot about bias, right? So we're up here. At intermediate horizons, uh, you still have to care a lot about bias, but maybe not you know, quite as much. So you know, the basic takeoff is here, there's a bias variance trade-off, but, it, but it's, it, it's quite steep. And to justify doing local projections, you, you really have to put a lot of weight on bias in your loss function relative to variance. Our second lesson though, is when sorry, we start introducing, uh, sorry, yes? Before setting the up, I couldn't give you, you, you was an explanation on the previous graphs, uh, the bias and variance. There is a jump, obviously, at horizon four. Does this have to do with the assumption of, your, of the lags, or? Yeah, yeah. So good point, right? So, um, so following, uh, you know, my previous paper with Christian, right? What we what we know is that up to horizon four, which is the number of lags we include, the two procedures are going to be not exactly the same in finite samples, but pretty close to each other, and and that is indeed what we see here. If we had included eight lags, as we do in the appendix to the paper we would get something similar, except the equivalence would be up to lag eight instead. Exactly, right? So that's, you know, this point that I was sort of mentioning earlier that at short horizons, there's no meaningful trade-off, right? Uh, but once you get to horizons greater than the number of lags you're including, that's when we need to think hard about the trade-off. Okay, so the second lesson that we draw from our results is that um, these shrinkage estimators can dramatically lower the variance of the, the impulse response estimates at some cost in terms of higher bias, but a relatively moderate cost in many cases. So basically what I'm doing in this slide is I'm just introducing the other estimation procedures that we talked about earlier. So in particular, the uh, blue line with crosses is the Bayesian VR. The green dashed dotted line is penalized local projection, and the light blue line with circles is VR model averaging. Okay, so um, let's start by comparing uh, penalized local projection to least squared local projection. So penalized local projection is the green line here, and you can see that this has substantially higher bias, especially at, at short horizons, than the least squares procedure, which has uniformly low bias. 
And this happens with all shrinkage estimators, right? That, that's the whole point. We're introducing a, a bit of bias by smoothing across horizons, right? I mean, not all impulse responses are very smooth, right? So, so we're going to suffer some bias when we do the smoothing. But the benefit is that the standard deviation of the penalized estimator is a, a good bit lower than the least square estimate, right? The smoothing leads to lower variance. Uh, similarly, if we look at the Bayesian VR, right, it has typically higher bias than the least squares VR procedure. Again, because you're, you're shrinking towards white noise and the data is not exactly white noise. But the benefit is that we get a lower variance uh, relative to the least squares procedure. Um, what about the VR model averaging? procedure. Well, this one actually turns out to not work that well in, in the implementation we're using. So you can see that it has both relatively high bias and relatively high standard deviation. So we were a bit surprised by this, but we dug a bit more into it. And that turns out to be because the model averaging weights that we get out of Bruce Hansen's procedure are actually extremely variable across simulations. So as it turns out, it's just very difficult to pin down the optimal weights uh, from the data in these particular DGPs. Uh, obviously, there might be ways of fixing this, but we took the procedure off the, the shelf. And so I'm not going to comment much more on the model averaging procedure going forward. So if so, again, obviously, we need to remember that the y-axis here are, are, are different scales. So if you try to look at the quantitative trade-off between these procedures, uh, it looks like this. So on the left, I'm again looking at the sort of trade-off between least squares local projection versus penalized local projection. The darker the cell, the more often do you prefer the least squares procedure to the penalized procedure. And you can see that except at short horizons, and except if you care a lot about bias, you actually tend to prefer the shrinkage procedure, the, the penalized procedure. So shrinkage is typically good, unless you really, really care a lot about bias. When we compare the least squares VR procedure to the Bayesian VR procedure, the picture is a little bit murkier. But if you sort of look closely at the colors, what you will see is that you still have to have a quite high weight on bias to prefer the least squares procedure more than 50% of the time. So, I, you know, the, the trade off is not quite as steep here, but still, the shrinkage procedure is usually preferred unless you're sort of mostly focused on bias in your loss function. Nico, can I ask you to go back to the Please. other the previous? I mean, this one? This is not, yeah, this one. So I know you're not doing this, but it kind of, uh, I'm, you know, very curious about what would happen to, um, you know, if you were to use, say, an overparameterized VAR, because it seems mm -hmm. like the variance, you know, falls pretty quickly. You know, there's not that much of a gain by doing shrinkage. You know, already the uh, VAR, it's a relatively parsimonious one, I guess, with four. But I wonder if, you know, if you care about this middle, horizons, if you use mm -hmm. a VAR with eight to 10, you know, you're gonna mm -hmm. get zero bias. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if the variance will really kick up that much because it seems like there's a very big fall here. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if you include eight lags in the VR, um, it is going to still look a lot. I mean, it's gonna be like, so the, mm -hmm. the standard deviation line is gonna look like this up to horizon eight. Uh, where I guess eight is here, and then it's going to, I agree, drop off fairly steeply, but not quite as steeply. Okay. Um, so, so again, up to horizon eight, you're going to get something that's quite similar to the local projection estimator. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but I mean, more generally, I, I think your, your point is very well taken. That's sort of like, um, suppose you care a lot about bias at shorter horizons, then it seems like it, it would make sense to, for example, run a VR with and very reasonably high number of lags. And then at the longer horizons, the extrapolation is going to kick in. Uh, you might have a bit of bias, uh, which you might choose to live with, but you're at least not going to have like very high variance estimates. Yeah, or you could just shrink at that point. So you just shrink when you care about long horizon. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, you're really sacrificing a lot of that. You know, by shrinking, you're sacrificing that nice lack of bias at short and yeah. medium horizons. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, the shrinkage is going to make the bias sort of potentially even worse at the long 
horizons, if the true impulse re response does not go to zero very fast. Right. Yeah. But um, but it, but does. if you're quite com comfortable that probably the impulse response is is not that that big at these longer horizons, then yeah, that would make yeah. sense. Definitely impose the shrinkage. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Cool. So um, our third lesson is that for a given loss function, there's no single method that's the best method at every horizon. However, one, some, some type of shrinkage procedure will typically be the best thing to do. So in this plot, I'm basically showing you the best method, namely the method that sort of minimizes the average loss averaged across CDPs. And I'm doing this again as a function of the horizon and as a function of the weight that you place on squared bias in the loss function. So the different sort of uh, colored regions in, in this you know, figure are the regions where you know, these different estimation procedures are the best thing you can do in terms of giving you the, you know, the, the lowest average loss averaged across CGPs. What I want you to take away from this figure is that most of the figure is either green, which is penalized local projection, or uh, the sort of blue with dots, which is Bayesian VR. Which, is, which are these two types of shrinkage procedures. Now, it is true that there is this slice in the sort of northeast here, which, of course, which sort of is, is either least square VR or the bias corrected VR that's best. However, at these longer horizons, there's not really much of an absolute difference between BVAR and these least square procedures anyway, because the impulse bond estimates are all very close to zero anyway. So like, if you had extended the BVAR region further north here, in sort of absolute terms, in, you, you wouldn't be changing much. So really for all intents and purposes, except maybe sort of a region and at sort of intermediate horizons where you have sort of fairly high weight and bias, um, you know, you should be doing either penalized local projection or BVAR. Now, uh, if you look very closely, if you have very good eyes and your screen has very high resolution, you will notice that there is a very tiny sliver that's orange. And theoretically, it extends actually over the entire um, horizontal line here, which is, which is least squares local projection, right? So again, obviously, local projection has the lowest bias out of all the procedures. So if you really, really, really care about bias, you should be doing that. But as we can see quantitatively, you really have to care almost exclusively about bias for that procedure to be the best. Okay, so I have uh, not that much time left. So I, I wanted to talk about some of the robustness checks we do in the paper, uh, and then a few final comments. So at first, as I did discuss with uh, Dimitris, um, for our GGPs, right, all of the time series are sort of safely transformed to stationarity. So you might ask what happens if you have sort of more persistence or if you care about the level of responses of certain series that have been distanced, right? So we look at this in the paper. So first of all, one thing we do in the paper is we mechanically try to make the, the, the factors in the DFM more persistent. We also try to look at the case where you take our baseline results, but instead of looking at the impulse responses for the difference variables, you're accumulating the impulse responses. So you get the responses for the level. You get qualitatively actually very similar results to what I've talked to you about except that the BVAR procedure is a bit more sensitive to the choice of, of prior. So, you know, if you have more persistent data or if you look at cumulative impulse responses, for the BVAR procedure, you, as a, as a practitioner, you, you need to be more concerned about whether you have the right prior. But otherwise, qualitatively, a lot of the trade-offs seem quite similar. In the paper, we also look at other identification schemes, recursive identification or instrumental variable or proxy identification. For recursive identification, actually everything looks very similar to what I just showed you. If you have an IV or a proxy, you know, we can look at other estimators as well. We can distinguish between external and internal instrumental variable estimators. So there's a further trade-off we can look at there. So I, I encourage you to look at the paper if you're interested. We also separately look at monetary and fiscal DDPs. We look at longer estimation lag length. We look at smaller sample sizes. We break down results by different variable categories. Uh, like focusing specifically on real activity variables, price variables, and so on. We also look at a smaller set of observables, right? So for the baseline, we have these 207 observables. But what we also do in the paper is we look at just, I think it's 18 
of the most used time series. And then we exhaustively look at all the combinations that we can do of five variables out of those 18. And surprisingly to us, the, the results are almost identical to what I showed you earlier. Finally, we asked the question, what if you don't care about the average performance or the median performance across CGPs, but you instead want a procedure that does well in sort of particularly difficult DGPs? So we, we answered this question by looking at the 90th percentile of the loss across DGPs instead of the median loss. And here, again, surprisingly to us, actually the trade-off turns out to be very similar. I mean, for sure, the loss is larger, obviously, at the 90th percentile. But in terms of the trade-off between the different procedures, actually, it, it turns out to be very similar. Um, so um, that's perhaps something that, that we could try to ex explore more in sort of future research of why exactly this happened. Can I, can I check how many factors you, you've been using in your DGPs? Uh-huh, yeah. Sorry? You know, how, um, how, how many factors are you are you assuming in your DGPs? Oh, we have six six factors uh, following Stock and Watson. So have, have you played around with a number of factors? Because, I mean, the, the dynamic factor model is basically, uh, you can rewrite it as a reduced run VAR, right? And, 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 the, and the less factors you use, the more shrinkage uh, you, you you impose in that VAR. If you, if, if you, I'm, I'm assuming if you assume a larger number of factors, then the, uh, the simple VAR will become more relevant relative to the VAR, right? And vice versa. Um, yes, I mean, some of that might be going on. So, I mean, so we're, we're, we're tying our hands in terms of following Stock and Watson, but it would be interesting, I guess, to, yeah, just try to increase the number of factors and, and see what happens in the estimation. Um, um, I mean, do, do, do you I see what I mean? You, you, would, can, you, you can would visualize that a reduced run VAR if you write it backwards in terms of the XT variables, right? So it would be like all this uh, BVAR autoregressive matrices are going to be uh, compressed by the loadings, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess by that's... definition, um, if you add additional factors, those factors will have less influence on the observed time series than the ones you already included. So um, if you buy Stock and Watson's argument that we have this sort of somewhat steep drop off in the scree plot after you have included six factors, I don't think the there should be that big of a difference, but it's certainly something we should look at. So uh, yeah, um, we, 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 we could check that out. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, so I'm almost out of time. So let me just very briefly mention, right? So many of you might be sitting with the comment that, you know, why don't we try to select the estimator that we use based on the data set that we have? You know, maybe that can give us sort of the best of both worlds. You know, we're gonna do local projection when that is good and we're gonna do VR when that is good. Well, I've already showed you that the VR model averaging procedure sort of performs quite poorly in our DGPs, which should suggest some caution. And we've tried to look into this. So in our TGPs, it turns out that conventional model selection and evaluation criteria are basically unable to de de detect even substantial misspecification of the VR4 model. So for example, as I mentioned, if you try to do the AIC, this is like the, the, the lag length, that basically never selects long lag length. If you do the standard sort of LM test of residual serial correlation in the VR4 model, you, you reject very rarely in basically all the DGPs. So it does not seem that these standard procedures sort of will give you any strong indication that you should do, you know, anything other than a low order VR. Um, so, you know, it, it might be that other procedures can be helpful in guiding the choice between VR and local projections, but sort of these standard procedures certainly do not seem to do the trick in these DGPs. So, uh... Uh, one, one question. I mean, um, mm -hmm. so th th thinking about you know maybe your next project on this, mm -hmm. which is maybe the the inference, mm -hmm. could we could could we combine these estimators to like somehow and then have you know have a, have a reasonable bias and have a re reasonable inference? Mm -hmm. So um, so in terms of estimation, um, I'm. We are doing the model averaging estimator, right? Which, which turns out to perform poorly um, because it's very difficult to pin down the, the appropriate model weights. 
so now that, I think one, that, that one uh, average between the between LP and uh, and VAR, is it? Not directly, but it it it's in, it, including a VR twenty in the set of models, and a VR twenty gives you very similar results to a local projection. So in that sense, uh -huh. Uh -huh. the local projection is kind of in there. Now you you could do something, let's say, just like literally just like averaging fifty fifty across local projection and VR. Right. Yeah, that's that's the other question. You I could, mean, maybe there is you could potentially do that. Um, yeah. And and I do think that that might work reasonably in many cases, but I'm not sure if we could convince applied people that that is a. Yeah, because it. I mean, it's sort of a good thing. One to can do, tend but, to yeah. think, okay, I mean, for, if I'm interested in the estimation, so I should provide, mm -hmm. let's say, LP, and then mm -hmm. if I want to do inference, then I go with the with the VR, right? I mean. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, maybe there is a there is a there is a W level that can allow you to, you know, to do the you know to combine both uh, and you know do well in terms mm -hmm. of estimation and in, in terms of inference. Potentially, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not something that we have thought a lot about. I mean, my intuition about inference, really briefly, I know I'm out of time, is that for our usual sort of confidence interval construction procedures, bias matters a lot, right? Like if you get the bias. Like if you have even a little bit of bias, it's going to destroy coverage properties. Yeah. In the usual way that we construct confidence intervals. So that's why I think if you want to do confidence like intervals, you probably have to weight bias quite heavily. Um, yeah. But that's that's another story. Um, so yeah. um, just just to very briefly like just summarize. So we did you know, and then I'm very happy to to talk more about inference in in a, in a yeah. sec. But uh, we, we did this large scale simulation study of different impulse response estimators. We drew our DDPs from an, from an empirically calibrated dynamic factor model. We drew three lessons. There's a clear bias variance trade off between the least squares procedures, but you have to care a lot about bias to prefer local projections. Shrinkage seems to be quite useful in, in lowering variance. It does introduce some bias, but not a lot. And there's no single method that dominates all horizons, but shrinkage tends to be good, in particular at uh, low horizons. Painless local projection seems good, and at longer horizons, the BVAR procedure seems reasonably favorable, although it is a bit sensitive to the persistence in the data. So thank you so much. So I'm very happy to continue the discussion, obviously, um, if you have any further comments. Thank you so much for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, so I, I would like to first uh, ask Rafaela, the guest panelist, if you have any questions or any comments, any thoughts. It's obviously an informal discussion starting at this point. So please. yeah, no, thanks. It's great talk. I think we need to stop. Here. Just like, I think we need to stop the recording at this stage, Majid. Um, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's a real question. <laughs>